15 seconds to sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. That's good. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody. And uh, on this, after a nasty, nasty Friday, Saturday, it sure is pleasant to see the sunshine today. And, and uh, so, very good. Are we enjoying the cool weather that's coming? No. Some are, some are. Yeah, there's always mixed emotions on that. And, uh, but uh, again, good to see everyone here this morning. Um, uh, Miss Gale was showing pictures of Boston. And uh, by the way, this is this Miss Gale. <laughs> Y'all don't know her. This is Carl's wife. And uh, for some of you folks that are new, and uh, but uh, the grandson uh, Boston was in an accident back in May, I guess it was, and uh, five months into it, he's, he's doing a lot better. Good picture, and uh, that she's got there on her phone, and so he's doing much better, and that's that's good news. Uh, very good. All right, uh, good to see you, Debbie, Hi. Deborah, <laughs> and uh, glad to have everybody here today. All right, well, let's go to the Lord, and then we'll get into our study today. Father, again, we're uh, grateful for a good day, and for all those that uh, uh, make time and, and plan their schedule to gather with us for Bible study on Sunday mornings. Especially thankful for those that are always so faithful. Lord, we pray for those that are away for one reason or another. Again, that you administer the needs of their hearts and lives as only you can do. Lord, we, as always, we're mindful that we all come with burdens and concerns and issues of life. Mm -hmm. Whether they be uh, health issues or family issues or financial issues. Uh, Lord, we all have burdens and concerns. Pray that you would uh, allow us to uh, set those things aside for a little while, and that you might uh, be able to captivate our hearts and minds as we study your word. Lord, to the end, that we might be uh, edified, encouraged, instructed, uh, that we might be able to take the things that we uh, hear and learn and see uh, from the word of God and put them to work in our lives in a real practical way. Lord, help us to be faithful to share the gospel of the grace of God and the truths of your word rightly divided. Again, thank you for each one. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, very good. Philippians. We're in Philippians. We're even there. Uh, my goal today is to finish chapter 2. We'll see if we're able to accomplish that. But uh, we'll begin reading verse 17 for time's sake. And we'll read 17 through 30. And we're going to talk about two specific individuals. We're going to talk about Timotheus and Epaphroditus as we go through this portion of Philippians chapter 2 today. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, again we're in Philippians chapter 2 beginning at verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again ye may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. And so let's uh, go back to verse 17 and begin walking through this. 
So as Paul starts at verse 17, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Now, of course, the context as we walk into verse 17 is, if Paul is he's in prison, he does not know what's going to befall him. Uh, he's in prison for the gospel. Uh, we have been through, you know, chapter 1 there. Uh, talking about that, talking about him being in a strait. Uh, verse 21 of chapter 1. Uh, well, this is verse 20 of chapter 1. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, that with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And so Paul knows he's there in that prison. Uh, of course, Paul's praying for and hoping for and anticipating a little bit of a respite. Uh, and we'll see that as we read through uh, our text where we are today. But yet he knows he's in a prison. He knows the power and authority of, of Caesar and the Roman Empire. And uh, I, I think even here he knows that ultimately he's going to lose his life for the, for the defense of the gospel. And so uh, when he comes to verse 17 then, he says, Yea, and if, if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith... I joy and rejoice with you all. In other words, I've planted the seed. I've given you the gospel. I've shared to you the revelations and the mystery that the ascended Lord Jesus Christ gave to me. And if I be offered, if, if I lose my life, then uh, I joy and rejoice with you all. And I think that goes back to verse uh, 15 and 16 there. Um, uh, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So again, what Paul had planted and instilled those doctrines upon which they had been established, then uh, uh, he knows that in the day of Christ, when we're caught up, God resumes his dealings with Israel and we're there in the heavenly places. Uh, Paul says that uh, I rejoice in that day uh, knowing that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So again, now verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon that sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. And so while they would not be pleased at uh, Paul losing his life, yet they would joy and rejoice that he gave himself for the ministry, uh, was willing to risk his life in order to present the truths that he presented to them. And uh, so they joy and rejoice with him in that. Now verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you that I also may know that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. So we're going to spend a little time talking about Timotheus and how uh, close he was to Paul and, and how Paul used Timotheus in the ministry. We know that uh, we have Timothy mentioned from the beginning back there. What is it about Acts 16 when we're first introduced to Timothy or Timotheus? And then we know that, Paul, that Timothy traveled with Paul on, some, on his missionary journeys. And Paul sent Timothy and uh, commissioned Timothy to do certain things. We know that Paul wrote two letters uh, to Timothy. One during the first imprisonment and then one during his second imprisonment. And so Timothy was the young man uh, that was uh, pretty much carried the mantle. You know, we think about Elisha, or let me get it right. Is it Elijah and Elisha? Isn't that the way it went? Elijah and Elisha. Do I have it right? Okay, you get those two mixed up. Elijah was the prophet. Elisha was his right-hand man. And so when Elijah was caught up, then Elisha carried on and received that mantle of Elijah. And so you got a similar thing going on here with Paul and then Timotheus. And so Paul says to the folks there at Philippi, 
But I trust in the Lord to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your <laughs> state. Now, go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, to your right here. First, just a few pages, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And Paul's writing there to the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians, and uh, he says something similar about Timothy or Timotheus there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse 1 and 2. 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. And with this took place, if you go back to the book of Acts, in Acts 17, 14, and 15, you don't have to turn there, it's just a reference. <coughs> But back there to Acts 17, 14, and 15, when Paul's, again, on those missionary journeys, uh, there was a time he went on to Athens, but he left Timothy uh, at Berea, and then, and then while Timothy was at Berea, he was not only there, but he was also, according to 1 Thessalonians 3, 2, uh, he went back up to uh, Thessalonica and... Notice what it says that Timothy's mission was there in verse 2 again of 1 Thessalonians 3. And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. And we could go on and read about uh, that there, but uh, I'm just trying to build and establish this ministry that Timothy had and how essential he was to Paul's ministry and Paul used him often to uh, uh, stay behind or to go to a place and help reaffirm and establish those believers uh, in the doctrines that were committed to our Apostle Paul. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So you're back to the right, or excuse me, back to the left. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to drop in at verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 4. But verse 16 and 17. Now the occasion that Paul's where Paul is in 1 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17, that can be found in Acts 19, 22. So again, you put those things together. <coughs> and so it's a, it's during that thing that's going on in Acts 19, specifically verse 22 that we have the occasion for this writing in 1 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17, where he says to the church at Corinth, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Again, we always emphasize where Paul said, Be ye followers of me. And then he goes on to say, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. And so Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, he tells them, be followers of me. And he said, this is the reason I sent Timothy to you, so that he would be uh, bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now here's a question. Uh, some folks want to criticize Paul and want to say, well, Paul really thought he was something. Uh, and I think we should back up. Was it that Paul thought he was something? Or was it that Paul thought that the truths that was revealed to him by the ascended Lord Jesus Christ were something? It's the second. The truth. It's the second, isn't it? God it's, thought he was something. God thought he was something. And God committed to Paul... Uh, that preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since before the world began but now is made manifest and so as Paul travels and as Paul goes about and preaches the gospel of Christ and the gospel of the grace of God and, and teaches folks those foundational doctrines of the body of Christ then we see here two, three occasions uh, in Corinthians and in Thessalonians and, and also now where we are in our text in, in Philippi, that Paul's sending Timothy, his right-hand man, his son in the faith, and he sends him to establish those folks, to bring those folks in the remembrance of those things that, uh, 
that the ascended Lord Jesus Christ taught Paul and that Paul taught Timothy and that Timothy wanted others to teach and others to get a hold of. If we know anything about the truths of Paul's doctrines today, it's because of the preserved Word of God that we hold in our hand, and it's because of that ongoing ministry of Timothy and then those that Timothy taught, and that ministry continued on. Uh, I'm mindful of uh, 2 Timothy. Just chase this right quick. 2 Timothy 2. It's familiar to us. But 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, where Paul tells Timothy, Thou therefore my sons, 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And so we see that was Timothy's role. That was Timothy's function in the body of Christ. As Paul was to... Uh, relatively soon lose his life. Uh, he was making it very clear that Timothy was the one to carry on his ministry. Mm -hmm. Just like Elijah and Elisha, it was Paul and Timothy. All right, now back to verse 19 of Philippians chapter 2. And so again, verse 19 where Paul says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send some Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. So we wanted Timothy to go, find out about him, of course come back and report. Verse 20, as he continues to talk about who Timothy was, he says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. And so Paul and Timothy were like-minded. Timothy had the same mind as the Apostle Paul. And of course Paul said, We have the mind of Christ. I have no man like-minded, and I've always been impressed with that expression, who will naturally care for your state. Paul's saying, it just is Timothy's nature to care for you. I have no man like-minded who will just naturally. You don't have to. You know, some folks, and you all know how this is, whether it's a workplace or a ministry or, or whatever it is, uh, some folks just look and they see and they step in and they go to work. They don't have to have a lot of instruction, a lot of encouragement, a lot, you know, they just, they just kind of know where you're going. They know what the mission is and they just step in there and like uh, the comedian said, they get her done. They just step in there and get her done. Uh, in the youth rescue ministries, we'd have staff meetings from time to time, and, and one of the things that I would often say is, I would rather put a bridle on someone than a spur on someone. Do you understand what I mean by that? I'd rather you see and get after it, and me say, whoa, slow down. Don't, you know, don't go so fast. Don't. You know, I would rather be checking them and putting a bridle on them to back, you know, back off, don't get ahead of yourself, than I would have to spur them and make them take every step forward with a spur. Well, I, so Paul says about Timothy, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. It's just his nature to naturally care for folks. Would to God we have folks in the ministry today like that, right? Folks that will just naturally be involved in the ministry, see what needs to be done, step in there and get it done, and just be busy about sharing the truth of the gospel and the doctrines revealed to our Apostle Paul. Now, he goes on now, verse 22. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. And so, of course, that proof being that uh, early in Paul's ministry there, Timothy has been right there side by side laboring with Paul, ministering to Paul, even following Paul there to Rome and ministering and being part of Paul's ministry there while he was in that prison in Rome. So Paul is saying, verse 22, you know the proof of him that as a son with the Father he has served with me in the gospel. Verse 23, Him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. So Paul's in the prison. He doesn't really know how it's going to go. 
Uh, obviously, he's, he's hoping, and I think as we read down through here, we'll see that he's anticipating the possibility of having a reprieve and maybe being released for a while, which I believe indeed he was, and went on a fourth journey. But he's saying there, verse 23, I hope to send him to you as soon as I know uh, what's going to happen with me here. And that's the idea there. When, as soon as I have some idea of what's going to happen to me, then I intend to send him on ahead and uh, so he can, uh, 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 because I want him to find out about how you're doing and uh, I want him to care for you and I want him to do those things I want him to do there to help you be established. All right. Uh, now verse 24, but I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. And so he says, I'm going to send Timothy a while long as soon as I know what's going on. But I also trust that I shall myself shall come shortly. So Paul's hoping for uh, being released and uh, having a period of time where he can have his freedom again. Now verse 25, yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. So basically he's saying, I intend to send Timothy as soon as I know what's going on with me. But now I'm going to go ahead and send Epaphroditus. And so there's, he picks up now talking about Epaphroditus. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, mm -hmm. my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Now, Epaphroditus is mentioned again in chapter 4, verse 18. Uh, look at chapter 4, verse 18 of Philippians. He says, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things that were, which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So apparently then Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus was a... A member of that local body of believers there at the church of Philippi and uh, he had come to visit Paul and to bring Paul a gift and uh, you know something from the church at Philippi some things that would meet Paul's needs there in the, the, the prison in Rome and so he came and he was there and Paul says I'm going to send him back to you and uh, so that's kind of how we know who Aphrodite was Timothy had been traveling with Paul for some time. Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus was fruit of the ministry there in Philippi. He had taken a gift, an offering, some, some you know, actual material things from Philippi, brought them to Paul, and now Paul's going to send Epaphroditus back to them there in Philippi. But notice what it says here about him. Uh, verse 25, 26, 27. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. So again, that tells us <laughs> what he was doing there and what was going on with him. It says, For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. And so Epaphroditus uh, either somewhere in his travels or once he got to Rome, he comes down with a sickness. And obviously it's apparent that it's a very serious sickness, verse 27, because it says, For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So somewhere along the way, Epaphroditus leaves Philippi, comes to Rome, gives Paul this gift. Paul identifies him as a brother, a companion in labor, a fellow soldier, a messenger from Philippi, and the one that ministered to Paul's wants. And talk about him being then full of heaviness because the folks at Philippi heard he'd been sick, and Paul says, indeed he was sick, nigh unto death. The man nearly died. But God had mercy on him. Well now, Let's talk about that for a little while. Here we are, Paul's now in a Roman prison. Of course, we, we know we're, if we follow Paul's ministry through the book of Acts, we know that he's there in that Roman prison. And the end of Acts, Luke tells us that he was spent two years there in his own hired house there uh, under house arrest, so to speak, in Rome. Again, I believe that he was released for a time and went on a fourth journey. 
and then found himself arrested again later, I think, in Troas. And so, uh, now during Paul's missionary journeys, what do we know Paul was able to do in those missionary journeys, in those in that, that period of time through the book of Acts? What was Paul able to do yeah. with sick folks? He could heal them. He could heal them. Go with me to Acts chapter uh, 19. Let's go to Acts chapter 19. Back to your left. Acts chapter 19. Verse 11 and 12. Acts 19, 11 and 12. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were wrought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So in Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12, it says that God wrought special miracles by his hand. I remember growing up in those Pentecostal churches in Oklahoma. I can remember specifically Kenneth Copeland. And Kenneth Copeland would preach, and I've got my bandana, Kenneth Copeland would have that white hanky. And Kenneth Copeland would preach and wipe his brow with that white hanky. Buddy, he'd preach and he'd wipe that brow and he'd throw that thing down and he'd preach and he'd wipe that brow. That anointed sweat. He'd wipe that brow. At the end of the service, they would take a pair of scissors and they'd cut that thing up. And people would get offerings kind of go to the highest bidder. Now this was, my goodness, this was 45, I say I'm 61, so I was 50, I was 13. How long ago was that? Well, right. well, long time ago. I guess that's how he made money to buy the first jet. Oh yeah, they still do that today. And they, it, that's where they get it from. That's right. They, they, they don't so. continue the story on. And they don't understand where I'm eventually going to be when, we're, when, when I get to the end of this trail we're, we're on. Yeah. In Paul's, and, and so that's what they did. Uh, that's where they get that, verse 12. So that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And so this is where they get that. Well, that's good enough for the apostle Paul. It's good enough for me. Now, like with many other things, in Paul's early ministry, the 12 apostles walked with Jesus, right? The 12 apostles were instructed by Jesus in his earthly ministry. To the 12 apostles came this outpouring of the Spirit of God demonstrated with all these miracles and signs and wonders that we see the 12 apostles of Israel doing under that outpouring and anointing of the Holy Spirit there in the early Acts while they're preaching that gospel of the circumcision, that gospel of the kingdom to the nation of Israel. Now here Paul, Saul of Tarsus is on the road to Damascus, gets confronted by the ascended Lord Jesus Christ and you know he's on his way to go after these folks of the little flock that followed Peter and the and the you know the twelve apostles of Israel, and yet he gets confronted, and the ascended Lord Jesus Christ speaks to him. Those men that were there heard the noise but didn't know what was said, right? And so here now this Saul of Tarsus, who's been this greatest persecutor, I mean no one. No one ever persecuted those kingdom-believing Jews like Saul of Tarsus did. And then when Saul of Tarsus is converted on the road to Damascus, nobody carried on with that thing. Nobody had that same zeal uh, to go against the little flock of Israel like Saul did. The Bible tells us that, that once Saul's converted and once Saul is you know, preaching uh, and, and you know, ends up going to Arabia and Damascus and then back to Tarsus, 
It says there that then the churches, those kingdom churches of Jewish believers in the, in, in the kingdom gospel, then they had rest because nobody else was doing that. All right. And so here's Saul of Tarsus who later becomes Paul our apostle. Now, if, if Paul shows up and he says, Jesus spoke to me from heaven, what's the 12 going to say? Yeah, right. And so we see in Paul's early ministry that he had the same signs of an apostle. And he tells us that. That he had the signs of an apostle. In other words, to give authenticity and credibility that God was moving in the ministry upon the earth from the twelve and Israel and the tribulation in the kingdom was putting all that on hold and was moving to Paul and Paul's gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, then it was necessary for Paul to have any credibility, any authority, any evidence of his apostleship that he'd be able to demonstrate those same things that the twelve did. His gospel was different his doctrine was different. And of course he received that by progressive revelation. He didn't get it all at once. But while his gospel was different and his doctrine was different, yet he had that same, the same apostolic gifts through most of the book of Acts. And we see that spoken of here in Acts chapter 19. Is everybody good to go? Is everybody can see that? Just follow me with that. All right. So, yes, there was a time when Paul did those things. Well, if, listen, if Paul was re rock, if Paul wrought special miracles here in verse eleven, and if even from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, in other words, things that that from Paul's body, things that Paul might well his brow with, and, and those things were taken to the sick, or those things that taken to, uh, as it says right here, diseases or evil spirits, if those things, in other words, they didn't have to see Paul. They could just take one of his handkerchiefs, take it to that person, and they could be healed of whatever was ailing them. Well, he was able to do that back here in Acts 19. Well, if Epaphroditus was with Paul in Philippi, in, Phil, in uh, the Rome, as Paul writes to the Philippians there, uh, why didn't Paul heal him? It says that God had mercy on him. He was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. All right, let's keep reading, looking at I might need that handkerchief. You know, you know, you know. How much are you going to sell that for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll cut it up and bid it out after a while. Five bucks. <laughs> All right. Uh, go with me to Acts 28. Now, coming toward the end of Acts, this is while Paul is it's after his arrest, after his appeal to Caesar. He's now... Uh, on a ship, and he is en route to Rome. This is before he gets to Rome. Acts 28, look at verse 1. We're going to read, excuse me, 1 through 10. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the islands was called, this is, you know, they were shipwrecked. <clears throat> Chapter 27, they, 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 you know, there was a big storm came up, and they were shipwrecked. And they found themselves cast on this island. Verse 44 says uh, of chapter 27, and the, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. And so again, they, they end up on this land. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 28. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, 
No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Now again, apostolic sign, authenticity of Paul's apostleship. Because way back there in Mark 16 where he says, you know, if they get bitten by, you know, a serpent, they'll live. So here Paul gets bitten by a serpent and he lives. See, verse 5, he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. <coughs> verse 6, how be it they looked when they should have, how be it they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm could come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Verse 7 now. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever <coughs> and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. And so here at Miletus, Paul gets bit by a snake, a venomous snake, and he should have died, but he didn't. And here he heals this, uh, 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 this uh, chief man of the island's uh, father, and uh, others that came to him. And so he had this power of healing here as he's en route to Rome. But once again, go back to uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 27, talking about Epaphroditus. He'd been sick. He indeed, he was sick nigh unto death. Doesn't say anything about Paul laying hands on him. It just simply says that God had mercy on him. So the simple implication is that while he was sick, nigh unto death, yet God had mercy on him, and he recovered. He did not die. He got better. Praise the Lord for that. Amen? Now let's see. Go with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Again, I believe Paul was released for a while. Went on a journey. I think he's arrested again. Or he eventually loses his head. It's during that last imprisonment before he dies that he writes 2 Timothy. And as he's writing to Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 20. So while he was out on this fourth missionary journey. Now he's back in prison in Rome again. But he picks up verse 20 just to drop in here. He says, Erastus abode at Corinth. In other words, I think the idea is Paul had been to Corinth on this fourth journey. He left Corinth. Or Erastus abode at Corinth. But Trophimus have I left at my Miletum sick. And so Corinth of Erastus stayed at Corinth and Trophimus who evidently was also traveling with Paul on that fourth journey. He says, I left Trophilus at Miletum. And how did he leave him? Sick. Sick. Now, does it make any sense that if Paul had these folks that were traveling with him, these folks that were ministering <laughs> with him, these folks that were laboring with him, such as Epaphroditus or Erastus, or not Erastus, uh, Trophimus, does it make sense that if Paul had the gift of healing, that he would not have healed them? Doesn't make any sense, does it? And so while he had the gift of healing, during those missionary journeys, up until he arrives in Rome, once he arrives in Rome and, and sees those Jews there in Rome and receives that final revelation Seeing you have put this from you, the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. And he receives that information. Then from that point, uh, and also keep in mind that during the Acts period, Paul was going to the Jew first. 
and also to the Greek, the Gentiles. And so from this time then, Paul now, because he's no longer going to the Jew first, the need to have that apostolic power is no longer required for his ministry. So he understood that. So Paul understood that. Because that would have been a discouragement, you would think, you know, to have that. And then, so when did he have that knowledge? Where, where does that come in at? I think by the time he gets to, once he gets to Rome, and certainly by the time he begins to, he's writing this letter to the Philippians, he knows. Because again, it was, it was, it was a necessary evidence for Paul to have those things in his ministry to go to Israel. It was not a necessary thing for his ministry to the Gentiles. Okay? The Jews require what? A sign. A sign. They always needed a sign. From the time God called Moses out there in Egypt, Israel needed a sign. So during Paul's ministry to Israel, during that Acts period, he needed to have the same apostolic gifts and signs that the 12 apostles of Israel had. But once he gets to Rome and that ministry to the Jew first is complete, and Paul says for the third and final time in Acts 28, seeing you have put this from, talking to those Jewish leaders in Rome, seeing you put this from you, the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and they will hear it, then obviously there's a change that takes place. While Paul had that gift of healing, to the Jew first as a sign to Israel, he did not have, and that thing was no longer part of his ministry as the natural course of things in the body of Christ today. Okay? And so he does not heal Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was nigh to death, but God had mercy on him. He did not heal Trophimus, but he left him at Miletum sick. And then one more place we want to look at, 1 Timothy 5, 23. When that gift was took from Paul at that time, do you think that they took it also from Peter and, and, and the twelve because of the fact that if, if Peter and them would have kept that gift, the Jews could have discredited Paul all over. He had it for a little while, but he's done something wrong or blah, 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 or whatever. I, 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 can't, I can't see the Lord taking it from one and <laughs> taking it from all at the same time. I don't know. I hadn't thought about that one. Uh, they were ministering to Israel, but by the time we get this far down, I don't know, Ron. I'd have to go back and kind of look and examine that a little bit. Uh, I know they continued their ministry to Israel. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, up until the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. Uh, specifically, they continued their ministry to the little flock of believing Jews. Uh, whether they retained those gifts to the day they died or not, I don't know. But I do believe that there was a change. And, and Billy, this is kind of goes in line with what you and I were talking about at the, before we started this morning. Uh, you know, part of that thing that with, with Paul is by the time he gets to those, that prison, what we'll call prison ministry, you know, things have changed. And uh, so now, is Jude, why, why does Paul no longer need it? Because he's receiving the complete, fulfilled Word of God, uh, and he's no longer ministering to the Jews. So to say whether or not they no longer had it, I don't know. Uh, to, I can fully see why Paul didn't need that, because again, he's no he, his concern is no longer for the Jews. He's going to the Gentiles. He's not focusing on the Jews. He's not. But at, at some point, and I can remember reading where Paul, you know, he would still like to reach his Jewish brother. I mean, he, you know, he laid down his life for his Jewish brother. Yeah, but again, all, where he writes and talks about that, that's during that those missionary journeys. That's the book of Romans. I could wish that I was a curse from Christ for my kinsmen according to the flesh. But that's why he's going to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
And I think by the time he gets to Rome, and we've read it before. Go ahead and go back there and look at it right quick. Acts chapter 28. I've referenced it, but let's go back and read it for ourselves. Because I think, I personally think it's a very significant passage of Scripture. Acts 28. Verse 7, I'm not going to read all of this, I'm going, to, I'm going to start at verse 17. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. This is after he arrives in Rome. So after he's been there for three days, he calls the chief of the Jews together. And, uh, and he begins to talk to them and present to them those things. Now verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul... So, so I guess I need to back up. So even when Paul gets to Rome, who does he go to first? To the Jew first. I mean, he's in Rome, but who does he speak to? These Jewish leaders in Rome. But then in verse 25, And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken the word, one word, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. And so Paul's quoting Isaiah and says, Listen, <laughs> one more final time, I am going to these Jews first. But they wouldn't hear it. So Paul says, Well spake Isaiah concerning these guys. Now verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. In Paul's missionary journeys, everywhere he went, who did he go to first? If there was a synagogue, he went in that synagogue. Everywhere he went on those missionary journeys, he went to the Jew first. Now he's coming here for this, and, and for the third and final time in the book of Acts, he's saying, I went to the, Gent the Jews, they wouldn't hear it, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. He said that two other places. He said that in Acts 13, 46. He said that in Acts 18, 6. But when he gets here, it's stronger <coughs> and it's different. And so he quotes Isaiah, and that's where he comes with the authoritative statement, verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. Not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And so... Uh, here for this third and final time, Paul says that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and they will hear it. And from that time forward, primarily who has responded in believing faith to the gospel of the grace of God? Jews or Gentiles? Gentiles. There's a rare occasional Jew that might come to faith in Christ. But by and large... Those who have believed on and trusted and received the gospel of the grace of God from Acts 28, 28 up to our present time, by and large, the vast majority are Gentiles. And so when he gets to that place where his ministry is no longer to the Jew first and also to the Greek, now it's to the Gentiles. All those signs that he needed to prove his apostleship to Israel and to show and to minister to them, he no longer needs. And this sign of healing is one of those things that went by that went by the wayside. Where do we go? First Timothy chapter five. First Timothy chapter five. Drop in at uh, verse twenty-three. Again, Paul writing to Timothy. This letter is written from Rome before Paul takes that fourth missionary journey. And so he's writing to Timothy. He says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities, 
So evidently, Timothy had a stomach problem, had often infirmities, and Paul doesn't say, hey, the next time I see you, I'll lay hands on you and I'll heal you. What's he say? Take some medicine. Take some medicine. Maybe God will have mercy on you like he did at Paphroditus. But take some medicine. And so when we go back here to Philippians chapter 3 again, let's wrap this up. I think for me, it's pretty clear, and if you study it out, consider it for yourself, where it says, verse 27, concerning Paphroditus, for indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Um, so Paul was, had, was sorrowful that Epaphroditus was deathly ill, and had Epaphroditus died, Paul would have even been more sorrowful, not only for himself, but for those who loved and cared for, and for Epaphroditus' ministry and so on. He said... Uh, so God had mercy on Epaphroditus, but not on him only, but on me too. In other words, it was merciful of God not to allow Epaphroditus to die. And so again, today when we have sickness and difficulty and problems, I mean, uh, we come back and when somebody's sick nigh unto death, uh, we rejoice and we praise God and we say, God had mercy on him. And uh, that they were sick nigh unto death, but they didn't die. And so we give glory to God and say God had mercy on him, uh, but there was no supernatural healing that took place by the hand of some apostolic figure because that's just not how God works today. God may have mercy, but not always, right? And so we need to understand that. All right. So concerning Epaphroditus, now verse 28 of Philippians 3, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrow. And wouldn't that be the case? They had heard that Epaphroditus was deathly ill, but God had mercy on him. Now he's well enough. Paul's sending him back home, and when he gets home, uh, they're going to be they're going to be rejoicing. Man, we're so glad that you're okay. Uh, and so again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrow. When y'all see him, I know that the joy that y'all will have when he's back in your presence. Verse 29. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. And so God had mercy on him. And, uh, and he was able to recover and uh, was able to go on and return and... Uh, and minister back there in Philippi. All right. Questions or comments about it? or additional things to say about what we've done here today? Everybody good with that? I hope so. Understanding that there was a need and a time and a place for those supernatural healings, but that time and place passed. And God is not in that place today where he's using people to do supernatural healings. Uh, when a person shows up, uh, there's, there's some folks over in Marshall, North Carolina. I'll hear them on the radio, uh, on WLIK, some days through the week. And uh, uh, he's, he, he's from Marshall, North Carolina, just the other side of, uh, of uh, Hot Springs up through there, like you're going to Asheville on 2570. And, uh, and he preaches on the radio, and, and every month or so, they'll have a three-day meeting, and they'll call them <coughs> healing meetings. Healing, and uh, you know, you come and get healed, uh, folks. God, that's not what God does today. God's not using people like that today. That was all about Israel, and God's not dealing that way today. And that's just the plain, simple truth of it. All right. If God was still dealing with that today, like that, Paul could have healed Epaphroditus. Paul could have healed Mileta or Trophimus, and Paul could have healed Timothy. But at that point, he no longer had the power to do that. And uh, we need to see that difference in that transition from the Acts period on into uh, the prison period of Paul's ministry. All right. Let's take a break. Amen.